Good morning, members. The Minnesota Senate Education Policy Committee will now come to order. We have quorum as of now. Um, I just want to remind members we're meeting in the Capitol on Wednesday in um, room 10 or 15, in room 15. So just I'll remind you at the at the end of our meeting as well. But um, if you're anything like me, you're going to show up here at 12:30 and wonder where everybody is. And um, so we're going to be in the Capitol. We're going to start today with Senate File 295, Heather, um, Senator Gustafson's bill. Senator Gustafson, welcome to the committee. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. Uh, before we begin, I do have an author's amendment uh, that I'd like to introduce now. Um, I believe you have handouts for that amendment. It is um, on page one, line nine. We would like to strike after July 1st, 2000. And for page one, line 18, delete certified and delete who hold a certification issued by RID. RID. Any further discussion on the author's amendment? Senator Augustuson, proceed. All right, thank you so much. Qualified trans literators and interpreters are essential in schools because they provide equal access to education for students who are deaf and have hearing impairments. Without interpreters, these students would experience significant barriers to fully participate in class and to receiving equitable education. Interpreters bridge the language barrier between students who hear and students who are deaf. ASL is a distinct language from English, its own grammar and syntax, and students who are deaf may not have the same level of proficiency in spoken English as their hearing peers. Interpreters can translate the information being presented in class into ASL, allowing these students to fully understand and engage with the material. Secondly, properly certified and qualified interpreters facilitate communication between students who are deaf and students who hear. They can interpret conversations between classmates, allowing students who are deaf to participate in group discussions and collaborative learning activities. They also help these students communicate with teachers and other staff, ensuring that they have the access to the same resources and support as their hearing peers. Finally, having a properly certified and qualified interpreter in the classroom also benefits hearing students. Interpreters can provide visual cues and modeling that can help hearing students better understand the material being taught and also provide an opportunity for hearing students to learn ASL and gain a better understanding of deaf culture. Increasing the level of certification for transliterators and interpreters in our school is necessary to ensure students who are deaf have hearing impairment and have hearing impairments have equal access to education. I ask you to support this bill. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Are there any questions before we proceed to the testifiers? Okay, Senator Gustafson, you got some testifiers, I'm told. I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Don't all hurry up at once. Testing, testing, testing. Hello, Chair Swazinski and members of the committee. My name is Dove Nathanson. I am currently in 11th grade. I am deaf and ASL is my native language. I have gone through 10 years of being denied equitable access to my education because school districts said that there was no legal recognition of deaf interpreters within K-12 systems and the services they provide. 
even though RID, the National Organization of Interpreters, confirmed that deaf interpreters are trained linguistic and cultural experts that work with DHH people to ensure equitable access across various settings, including K-12, the district has disregarded that because of a technicality in the law. Being denied that support that could be provided caused me unnecessary struggle academically and contributed to significant delays in my educational process. The solution to the problem is simple enough. Fix the statute to recognize these qualified professionals. We have done our due process of working with everyone we possibly could to resolve this. My district, Minnesota Commission for the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing, and Minnesota Department of Education. We are here to ask you to help you not delay this fundamental civil right for us any longer to obtain effective access to education. It has been far too long. It may be becoming too late for me, but I still have my brother here and other kids who want to see, I want to see this get better for. Hello, everyone. My name is Galvin Nathanson. I am a freshman. I also have a learning disability. So this need for this kind of language support could be provided by having a deaf interpreter during my education is even more essential for me. Deaf interpreters are often more experienced working with people like me and know how to fit me better. This would make a huge difference for me to have that expertise supporting me to succeed. It has been frustrating to watch my brother go through this problem growing up, then to know that the same comes for me. This is not okay, and you all have the power to fix it. I request that you pass this bill so that the excuse can no longer be used to deny access for kids like me anymore. We need full language access for our education and for our future. Please, thank you. Th um, before you leave, gentlemen, um, Thank you both for testifying. It's courageous and brave on your part to come before us. And we just want to thank you. And I'm not sure if any of my colleagues have any questions for you. But we, if you don't mind staying for a second to see. And also Absolutely. make sure you sign in. It's the sign up sheet up there. Will do. Thank you. Any questions, committee? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And really just a comment. Uh, I think I recall at least one of these gentlemen uh, testifying via Zoom last year. And I just want to say it's very good to see you in person. This is a great bill. Hopefully we can get it done. And I appreciate you both being here to share with us the frustrations you experienced so that we can hopefully do something about it. Uh, thank you to the, the author as well. Appreciate it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you both. Felicia Lane. Uh, sh I believe, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I believe that she's unable to join us today. Um, if you just give us one moment, I think we may have one more testifier um, on the list. Nick Zapko, welcome to the committee. I'm very happy to be here. Chair Swadzinski and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to be here and share my thoughts on Senate File 295. As some of you may know, I have interpreted for Governor Waltz during the pandemic and the horrific riots that were happening. This access changed our Minnesota community. Both deaf and hearing communities went through our crisis together. We were all together during this crisis, and as a result, 
our deaf community felt they were truly a part of the state of Minnesota. They were able to share their feelings, express concerns, clarify information, and experience encouragement and hope just as people who hear have historically done. And this access made those years more bearable and helped in our healing. We are grateful to Governor Waltz and his team for being willing to provide access through a CDI. Now, Senate File 295 focuses on providing a CDI in school settings for deaf students. And the benefits of having a CDI allows for more depth to the school experience. It provides a deaf role model, a language model, and possibly more fluid social engagement for everything that is happening within a classroom. Many deaf students have experienced being sidelined, like Dove and Galvin Nathan Nathanson. They were left out all the while trying to reach out to receive inclusion at school when interacting with their peers, teachers, and staff. And it didn't have to be that way. You can change that. By passing Senate File 295, deaf students would have an opportunity for a well-rounded and comprehensive education. One of seeing role models and other students that they can learn and grow from as they're developing their identity. And as you know, during school years, elementary through high school, students will be looking to their teachers and thinking, oh, there's a role model and I could become like my teacher. As they're growing up, they would think, I could also be a teacher. And that teacher of the future already understands students and student behavior. And the same thing for being a CDI. I personally was a student. I've gone through the same experiences that these students have gone through. And just having one ASL interpreter that I had to attend to through the school years, I missed out. If I would have had a CDI, I would have had similar experiences as hearing peers. And so, having a CDI would create better success for students and they could apply, if we could apply the same thinking as what happened during the riots and the pandemic, of having full access, and if we could have the same application for school settings, that would make a huge difference. Now, knowing that in the state of Minnesota, our children are priority, so let's show that with the students and their families by passing Senate File 295. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did, Senator, did you sign in, Nick? Sorry if I'm calling you Nick. I feel like I'm talking to like Madonna or somebody. You don't even have a last name. That's perfectly all right. Perfectly all right. Senator Gustafson, did you have another testifier? Did um, somebody? I don't believe so. Okay. I think we. Oh, we do. I'm sorry. My. Was there anything else needed of me? Nick is asking. Am I excused now? Um, well, there, were there any questions? Okay. She's invited what, to stay if she would like. Yes. Can she? You're invited to stay. Please. Sure. I'm happy Thank to you. stay. Good morning. Chair Swadzinski and committee members, my name is Alicia Lane. And I am testifying as the Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Commission for the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. I'm here to express the Commission's support for Senate File 295. 
The goal is straightforward. Recognize certified deaf interpreters or CDIs as educational interpreters. The way the current statutes are written, they exclude CDIs from being considered educational interpreters in the state of Minnesota. CDIs have knowledge and experience on par with hearing interpreters, and there's no reason they shouldn't be viewed as educational interpreters by the state of Minnesota. Right now, literacy is a hot topic in our state. To be able to read, a child must first have access to usable language. Not just any language, but usable language. For a deaf, deafblind, or hard of hearing child, even with hearing technology, vocalized language is often not fully usable. Access to strong sign language models, preferably through direct instruction, then becomes critical for literacy and overall cognitive development. I became deaf as a baby and had no measurable hearing since then. Most of my school career, I was the sole deaf child among my classmates and did not receive direct instruction. My hearing interpreters did their best, but trying to learn through an interpreter for hours on end was exhausting, frustrating, and inefficient. Fortunately, I had parents at home who signed, along with a natural affinity for reading. These advantages partially compensated for lost time in the classroom, but few children have those advantages. Watching an interpreter, a hearing interpreter, for hours on end is a huge cognitive burden to put on a child. A CDI draws from their native fluency in ASL to shoulder some of that cognitive burden so the child can focus more deeply on learning the actual content. With the CDI, the quality of the child's learning becomes closer to that of direct instruction. Another barrier for our children is the current quality of hearing educational interpreters. With the ongoing severe shortage of hearing educational interpreters, MDE has extended the waivers they issue for hearing educational interpreters who fail to meet score requirements on performance assessments. And this means not only is the pool of interpreters being smaller, it's also of lower quality. Opening up this interpreter pool to CDIs means they can be put to work to mitigate that impact of quality issues and potentially accelerate the professional development of the hearing educational interpreters. Please support Senate File 295 to allow CDIs to support literacy and equitable learning access for all children in Minnesota. Please also note the Minnesota Council on Disability has submitted a letter of support. The Minnesota Commission of the Deaf, Deafblind, and Hard of Hearing thanks the Minnesota Council on Disability along with Senators Gustafson, <laughs> Kroon, Seeberger, Hoschild, and Swedzinski for supporting this bill. And thank you for your time. Any questions, committee? Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and I've had the privilege to work with uh, 
your, the very long name of the Minnesota Commission for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Minnesotans or whatever it's called. Um, and I really appreciate this bill. I think it just adds one more option that they can pick from. They don't, it seems like that's a, like a, something that would be like, what a great idea. And I, I, I do appreciate the young men coming forward and the rock star being here with us today, um, Mr. Chair. So um, is there anybody that has concerns about this? It just seems like a easy common sense bill. Is, is anybody, is the school board is gonna testify that they don't like it or are they happy with it? Or I, it seems like they should be happy too. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator um, Wiesenberg. Wiesenberg, yeah. Wiesenberg. Thank you, Chair. That's the last time I'll make that. <laughs> That's right. We, yeah. Um, so I, I had uh, uh, an ex who was deaf, hard of hearing. So I guess, and maybe I missed it. So is CDI, is that someone who is hard of hearing or? Oh, it's not okay. So here's what I guess where I'm going with the question is, I know when she was in school, she thought of maybe becoming an interpreter, um, but she was frustrated because she was 25 year old that knew sign language, and it seemed like she didn't. She didn't want to take all the classes, and I'm just wondering if there's um, a way that someone like her could do this, but maybe not have to take. Obviously, you need to be educated and know what you're doing, but. If you already know sign language, do you have to go through those courses? And I think that would make it easier for people like that to get these positions. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. I um, I'm also would love to see more people go into this line of work. However, the CDI is actually the Certified Deaf Interpreter. And what this bill would do is uh, rise the level of quality of interpreters in schools so that students um, have the, the level of trans interpreters and interpreters that they need. Um, as it is now, there isn't as stringent of requirements, and because of that, it can make it difficult. So as you heard um, some of these high schoolers testify, imagine learning you know, trigonometry, world history, American literature, um, with uh, somebody who maybe wasn't certified um, at, a, the, at the same level um, would, that would be required for that course. And then that puts them at a disadvantage, which we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but there is a two-year gap on there, so people who are currently uh, working in schools will have some time. Um, but it is, I think, you know, what what we want, and I, I will let um, one of our testifiers uh, speak more to this, but we want a higher level of quality in the interpreters in the schools so that the students have a fair shot at learning the same things that hearing students he learn. Um, and if it's okay with you, Mr. Chair, if I could defer. Certainly. So. Again, my name is Alicia Lane, and a CDI, I believe your question that you mentioned was about an individual who is hard of hearing, and so I'm wondering if that, you were wondering if that individual might have the option to become a CDI in the future, and yes, the, to clarify, certified deaf interpreter is individuals who are deaf themselves, they have to have either native or near native American Sign Language capability, as well as having a hearing loss. And so um, if a person did not grow up with American Sign Language, then probably that would not be the best fit. There are some exceptions where there are deaf individuals who do not have native nor near native ASL. But how this works is that then, which with a CDI is you would have a hearing interpreter who would take the, the spoken language and put it into American Sign Language, but then would have a certified deaf interpreter who would actually be providing the interpretation for the student in the native language. And I'm gonna actually defer to Nick to explain more about that process. Thank you so much, Alicia. So if you can imagine a math class and you've got numbers written up on the board, the instructor is speaking and they're just moving along, right? And so with an ASL interpreter, they're gonna be saying three plus five, and they're just trying to get that information across. 
With that pace, though, what would happen with a CDI is that you would still have a hearing interpreter who would be working, and then they would take the certified deaf interpreter, would then take the information and actually put it into native-like language, and it would be happening at the same time with the CDI present. So the CDI would not actually be a teacher, but they're a role model of language and cultural facilitation so that at the same time understanding that a hearing interpreter does not have the same kind of experiences as a deaf person growing up. And so then if you have the two working together, you get the whole picture that is given to the student so that the student has the opportunity to fully understand and progress in their lives. Is that a little more clear? Senator Wiesenberg? Uh, yeah, so I think, um, I'm just trying to draw back on, like, I know when, I'm just thinking when my, when she was like in class, she would hear, she could hear, she was born deaf, so she used ASL, um, but she could hear some things and the interpreter, she's like, the interpreter signed it wrong, you know, so I got, that's where I'm trying to get to that, you know, where she's like, I can do better is what she was thinking to herself. She could hear what's going on and be able to sign it to somebody else. So yeah, that's where I'm coming from. You know, if there's a person like that. Right, exactly. Right, okay. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. I think we're good, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, Senator. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, I, I just wanted to thank you for bringing this bill because I think we should just uplift uh, what has been said, right? The, the mental load of having to interpret literal interpretation, right? I can sign my name, but it has its own sign. And that's different for children learning in their own language. And this is just so important and um, relieving that burden so they can learn and, and get instruction in their own language in class is just, you know, the basic thing that we can do. But I'm so excited to see these advocates here and, and to have this bill move. So I want to thank Senator Gustafson and all these folks coming to, to talk about this because I think it's really easy to miss if you're a hearing person. Um, but it's important that we know those things so that we can do right by the children of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Gustafson, before I ask you for your final remarks, I failed to ask for, um, to vote on the author's A1 amendment. So all those in favor of the author's A1 amendment, say aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment passes. <clears throat> final comments? I just think that um, I want to thank the people who have testified here today and also any time that we can make school more accessible and equitable for all the students in our state, I think that's a move in the right direction. So I appreciate your time. So committee will be voting to lay the bill over. No. Okay. Just a sec. Oh, yeah. Um, we're um, moving the um, Senate file 295 to be recommended to pass and re refer to the Committee on Education and Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Congratulations, Senator Gustafson. Thank you. Thank you all Thank you. for testifying as well. Next, we'll be hearing Senate File 123. Senator May Quaid, please introduce yourself for the records and begin your opening statement. Thank 183. you. 183. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening or afternoon, committee. Um, I'm Senator Erin May Quaid. For those who might be watching and or listening, I'm a black biracial woman with long brown hair, wearing pinkish red lipstick and black glasses and a white shirt. Um, I'm excited to bring Senate file 183 before you. Members, there are a number of ways bills come to us. Sometimes it's from a constituent. Sometimes it's work you might have been part of outside of the legislature or as a senator. And sometimes uh, it can be both. And I really want to thank, before I get into this, the work of the folks who did 
the work to get this bill here before I am bringing it across the finish line. And in particular, I want to thank Senator Duckworth, who I know was an instrumental part of um, getting groups together around this bill to get it to where it is today. Um, and I want to thank all of the grassroots organizations that really pulled together the experiences of their lives and their families and their children um, to get where we are. So Senate File 183, um, is really a huge grassroots effort led by families of children with disabilities who were concerned about the practice of withholding recess as a form of punishment. And we're going to hear from folks that are going to talk about how that impacted either their families or impacted them personally or hear a little bit more about the science behind this. But what we know is that students are more attentive and more productive in classrooms when they receive regular breaks for recess. Recess promotes not only physical health, but social development and cognitive performance. We know that a student's ability to refocus is stimulated by breaks from the classroom. Recess offers children valuable opportunities to learn communication skills, negotiation, cooperation, sharing, and problem-solving skills. And often, recess gives children a necessary means to manage stress. We know that all behavior is communication. As a new parent, I have an eight-month-old and I'm learning, all behavior is communication of some form. And so all of this work that stakeholders have done to find language to get to peace in the valley, um, we have brought forth a common sense provision that recognizes the evolving science of child development. And it's time that our school discipline practices evolve to reflect that new knowledge. And Mr. Chair, with that, I will turn it over to our testifiers. Welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you. My name is Simon Hofer and I am in fifth grade. When I was younger, some of my teachers made me stay inside during recess when they thought I was misbehaving. I didn't like it. I don't remember what I did that made them tell me to stay in, but I am autistic, so it probably had something to do with my anxiety. I get anxious a lot in school, and sometimes I say things I shouldn't when I get stressed out. Sometimes I need to move my body when my teachers want me to sit still. Sometimes I had to stay in for recess. It felt bad, and it didn't help me behave the way my teachers wanted me to. I made a list of five reasons why recess should, be, should not be taken away from kids. Kids need to move. They will get grouchy when they don't. Number two, kids need to exercise and get fresh air. Number three, taking, away re taking recess away almost never helps. It just makes things worse. Number four, when we have to stay inside instead of playing outside, it usually just makes us more likely to make bad choices. Number five, what if someone just has anxiety like me? Like me, then it isn't under really their, and it kind of isn't really under their control. I don't think teachers are trying to be mean, but making us stay inside doesn't help kids do better. I would like teachers to stop taking recess away from kids when they misbehave. Most of us are trying really hard to make good choices, but sometimes we just can't. Taking away recess or lunch just makes it even harder for us to behave. Instead, I think teachers should talk to students and ask them what w would help them do better next time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hofer. Any questions for the testifier? Before, um, Mr. on behalf Chair, just good for him to come. This is awesome. You're my hero. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say that, Senator Abler, so thank you. No, that's hilarious. Great. Um, I'll just echo what Senator Abler just said to the three, I believe, three students that came. Um, I don't know what class you missed today at school or whatever, but um, I hope this m memory of testifying before the state Senate proved edifying and delightful for in your bucket list, so to speak, because I'm sure this was on your list to testify at the Minnesota Senate on some <laughs> bill that you were passionate about. Thank you, Mr. Hofer. Thank you. The next testifier, please. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Heather Von Bank. I am a I'm a little nervous. I'm a professor at uh, Minnesota State University, Mankato. 
in the Department of Family Consumer Science, and I teach child development. We know that recess is important and imperative for the social, emotional, cognitive, and physical development of children. In 2013, the American Academy of Pediatrics wrote a policy statement saying that recess serves as a necessary break from the rigors of concentrated academic challenges in the classroom. Not only does recess allow children to be more attentive and productive in the classroom after the recess break, studies show that recess provides a chance for children to practice refocusing and that any type of activity at recess benefits children's cognitive performance. The Academy further states that recess, quote, should never be withheld as punishment as it serves as a fundamental component of development and social interaction. Minimizing or eliminating recess can negatively affect children. And teachers need all the tools in the toolbox to help children meet their developmental goals. And recess is a tool that helps build children's capacities in and out of the classroom. In 2021, I surveyed Minnesota parents about their children's recess before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we found that parents are well aware of the benefits of recess. Parents think that recess is an important part to getting a good education. Out of the 185 respondents that we asked, 80% agreed that recess should not be withheld as punishment. Parents identify the benefits of recess as relaxation, socialization, helps children's problem solve and manage their emotions. But most of all, recess is for playing and having fun. 83% of parents said that recess should be a required part of the school day, and parents noticed a change in their children's behaviors if they do not have recess. Even during the peak of the pandemic, during distance learning, parents made a daily attempt to include recess at home. Most parents reported that their children get on average of about 20 to 25 minutes of recess a day. Why should we withhold the only time during the day that children have to play with their friends and not have adults telling them what to do? We know better and the research tells us that children need play and recess is a right, not a privilege. Recess should be part of a regular school day and not viewed as an opportunity to make up classwork or punish children. Recess lets children play, and through play, we prioritize relationships over punishment and focus on building connections rather than creating barriers. You all have been sitting here so politely in your chairs, and I'm sure some of you are wiggling and tapping your toes ready to stand up. Imagine if someone told you you couldn't have 20 minutes of recess. Thank you, Dr. Van Bank. Um, are you looking for the sign-up sheet? It's being used. It's being signed. Questions for the testifier? Thank you, um, Ms. Van Bank. I just want to say um, you used the phrase "kids should have fun," and um, I taught for 33 years. And about my last five years, I taught an 86 minute class and to expect high school kids to sit for 86 minutes. And I started having them do yoga halfway through the class, just simply for 60 seconds, um, something that they could just stand next to their desk, like eagle poles or something like that. And, and the kids loved it and they laughed and they giggled and they had fun and they stood for 60 seconds. And an administrator asked me, um, because where is this in the curriculum? <laughs> and so I had to stop doing it. But for one year I did it and the kids, I, I wholeheartedly agreed with your, your thoughtful analysis and I hope you can catch a breath now and you yeah. did fine. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Welcome I, to the committee. I was the kid in school who never sat still and who always talked out of turn, and I love a microphone. So I'm so, a lot of people get nervous. I love speaking. So my name is Heather Anderson. I am a former educator. I'm a community organizer. I work as an education equity advocate, and my favorite role is that I'm a parent. I have freshmen in high school. I'm a white mom to black children, and so there is a lot of layers to the way that I come into this conversation. 
But in my early years of teaching, uh, I used the method of removing recess from students. It was what everybody around me did. It was um, a common practice. It was also interesting to me, though, that on this, the same group of teachers who would take an entire 20 minute recess away from an entire class would also moan and groan and complain at the announcement of indoor recess because it was raining or 20 or 30 or 40 below, right? So we knew that our job was gonna be harder in the afternoon if those kiddos didn't get to go outside and play. But that never translated to any change in the way we related to like that child right, that one kiddo. That kiddo was always the one who was sitting out on the sideline, repeatedly. So I never knew that there was another way as a young educator to be able to change or to uh, ask for new behavior from children. That was just simply what we did. It wasn't until I was a mom, until my two little bouncy children got off of the bus in first grade, both crying because they didn't want to go to school the next day because they already knew that they had lost their entire recess for the entire next day, right? So the mama bear comes out in me. Thankfully, I have a partner who's very calm. And we sat down over dinner and we had lots of questions. And then we sent an email carefully crafted by my calmer partner to ask the teacher why our children were going to get to go to recess. And the answer was that the entire class had been too loud while the teacher was trying to test you know, individual kiddos on reading. So we talked to the teacher, we went in and we had a meeting. We, I never, by the way, believe that an entire class is doing anything. There's always one child who's not. Um, and so what we came up with was a plan that I would go in while the teacher was teaching and while she was trying to listen to kiddos read, and I would manage the classroom for her so that she could do this work. Because while the district was requiring her to test every single child on their reading level individually, they hadn't offered her an aid or any type of support system in order to manage the other 27 little kiddos who were running around, right? So I fielded very important questions like, can I go to the bathroom? He's pushing me. I can't find a purple crayon. And what is that stuff on your lips? But in my years, uh, in many years now as a parent and as a person who gets to spend a lot of time in schools, I have to tell you, this is a common practice. Uh, a certain, well, I sit here and say this, there was a fifth grade student that was in my children's classroom that the teacher really just didn't care for. I watched that child sit in the hallway every single day that I volunteered. Every single day, he was the one kicked out of the classroom. When it was time to have the bake sale, he was not allowed to come down and do the bake sale with us because he hadn't finished his math paper. Imagine puni being punished, like saying to a child, because you haven't finished this work that has to do with math, you don't get to come down and make change with the other kids, right? And so there is this sense in the teaching, in, in this concept that the only way that we can make change in behavior is be by being punitive. It doesn't work. It didn't work for my children. It doesn't work for students. Uh, this week, uh, there is an entire middle school class at a Minneapolis public school that is having silent lunch because some students fought. Is that working? I don't know. But in the meantime, we're, we're not giving children a chance to like, like work through things, to play, to have um, time together. And so I learned to volunteer my way through my children's um, school years in order to help with that. But I would say that there's another way. I think that teachers and students are creative. I think we can ask each other things like, what do you need in order to be able to sit still in math? Would it be fun for you to make change at the bake sale? And if you do that, would you be able to finish this math paper? I think that we can come up with new ways that aren't quite so archaic. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Thing. Okay, thank you. Mr. Aronson, I do believe you're next. Mr. Chair and members, my name is Roger Aronson. I represent the Elementary and Secondary Principal Associations. I want to start out by saying we did have um, some significant work that we did with Senator Duckworth on this earlier, um, and, and a lot of that is reflected in, in Senator Maquade's bill here. Um, the, the person that actually worked on that committee was our president, Jason Luxick, who's an elementary principal in Bemidji. Um, and and you, we can see some of the language that we talked about in here as we worked through this. 
couple of things we just want to draw the committee's attention to, and we have an elementary principal that's going to testify online here shortly, but a couple of things we want to draw your attention to. Um, there are a couple bills you're, you're going to see, this is the first of them, that has a standard in it for when principals and teachers can do particular things. This says that we can withhold recess if the student is, quote, likely to cause serious physical harm. Um, as these standards go by you, I think you should look at those closely, as we discussed it, and, and um, I've communicated this to... Um, Sorry, Mr. Yes. Aronson, can, were you citing a line in the bill? Yeah, I can, can you. Tell you. help us with that line? No problem. That is in um, um, line 2.4C1, and that says that you cannot use a recess detention unless the student is causes or is likely to cause serious physical harm to other students or the staff. Um, and you're going to see this in a K-3 discipline bill that's coming later this week as well and into some of the committees. We think you might want to modify that to say poses a safety threat. Um, it's a lower standard. Um, it might be easier for teachers and principals to administer. I think it might get to the same place that the senator wants to get with her bill. Um, and we have raised that in some of the other discussions as well. Um, the, the second thing that I would say is the bill has in the, um, and this would be at line 2.14, that says we have to compile information on recess discipline every year. Um, members that have been on this committee for a while have heard a lot about special education reports and forms and um, things that people have to fill in. This is a pretty extensive list. Um, and the first piece with it, when it talks about the student's age, grade, gender, race, ethnicity, I think the, the department people would tell you that there's a problem that you may be able to personally identify some students if we identify all of that here. And, and we don't do that in the statewide discipline reports that we get, and I, I, don't, I don't think you'd want to do that here either. You might think about it. Um, it talks about that this data is to be collected to help us in PD. I would say we can do an awful lot of professional development. I, I don't know that this data is going to help us as much as, for example, some of the testimony that you've heard here already, uh, particularly the five reasons from the very compelling youngster. Um, uh, and then the last thing that I would say um, is, you know, this is a bill that talks about teacher practice and administrative practice. And you're coming in now to say we're going to codify what we think best practices should be. And we would say the committee should always look at those very, very closely as we step through them. One of the advantages of having local control is we can look at these locally. You make the decision sometimes that it's important to do this on a statewide basis. We understand that, you know, as we go through it. But I think that that means you need to have extra care because once you pass these bills, it is very, very difficult to change them. So, Mr. Chair, we, we appreciate the bill, appreciate the testimony. I mean, all of that... Um, I think the, the youngster that was here, he is a shining example of why people go into elementary education and um, elementary administration. It's a wonderful place to be. One of the dangers in these bills is we've heard a lot of them is we have 880,000 students in Minnesota and you don't hear a lot of the kids that really, really have good days. And, and we have an awful lot of good days in K-12. We want to make sure that more people have good days in K-12. That's the point of the bill here. Um, but I, I wouldn't want you to overlook the fact that, that overall there's a lot of people that do a really good job out there, even if they try to inject yoga into social studies. <laughs> I'm sure there's an administrator I'll have to talk to about that somewhere, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Jamerson. Any questions? Committee? Thanks, Senator. I think we have a testifier online. Or? I have one more in person. Okay. Yeah. Come on up and present yourself and sign in. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kelly Kozel. Um, I'm actually a constituent of Aaron May Quaid. Um, I want to talk about this in two different lenses. So the first lens that I'm going to talk about is parent. Um, I have a 14-year-old child named Noah um, who is on the autism spectrum, has expressive, um, expressive receptive language delay, anxiety, ADHD, and a gait disorder. For many years, I didn't know 
really what was going on with him. Um, come to find out the last couple years, he would um, line stim, so he would edge stim, and he'd want to go in every single room, um, like know the whole entire building, and I found that kind of interesting. I didn't know why. Um, he ended up having to have eye surgery. Um, he had a strabistus in his eye, so one eye would be this way, and this eye would be this way. And so a lot of times during his younger years, um, if a teacher would be like, you know, direct your vision to me, one eye might be this way. And it caused a lot of um, issues. So in second and third grade, um, my son um, didn't even make it to lunch or recess because he was suspended because of a behavior. And what the behavior was is um, he would knock over bookcases and try to like destroy the whole entire room. So as a parent, I would try to walk him, because he loves to walk and run and swing. I tried before school to like let him be on the playground all year long, um, walk, do whatever, to try to give him that let's go, like it's going to be a great day at school. So I tried that. Um, it didn't, it didn't end up working. What ended up working is getting a new case manager. Um, and then he never had any behaviors or suspensions again, but he was quite upset. He could not have lunch and recess with his peers. And he still talks about it to this day. Mm -hmm. um, my second perspective is I actually work in the school. I've worked, um, I've volunteered, but then I started working um, officially in schools um, in the cafeteria. So I've done both non-public K through eighth and public school K through eighth, and I do super snack at the high school. Um, I can tell you, I know the classes that go to recess before they go to lunch versus the classes that go to lunch and then recess. Um, you have to meet kids where they're at, and that is very difficult to do. Um, a lot of times, in my son's case, if you don't know the antecedent, um, what is going on with that child. Um, I think one of the things that I see that a lot of people can't see is, I mean, I see those kids, and I, there's such an underserved population of kids. It's those kids who get moved or get nope, can't do recess, can't do this, can't do this fun thing, when it's those kids who need the movement, they need the swinging, they need, they need so much. So I just, I want to make sure that we're doing this bill for those kids and like my child. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hauser. And the last testifier is virtual. Chris Ber Ber Berkeley, and we saw him earlier, so I know he's there. Welcome to the committee. S state your name and proceed, please. Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Chris Berkeley, and I am the elementary school principal at J.A. Hughes in Red Lake Falls, Minnesota. Uh, geographically, we're 45 minutes east of Grand Forks, North Dakota. So we're, we're up quite a way. We're a smaller school. But uh, I've been aware of Senate File 183 for some time and, and followed its progression. And I do believe, as Mr. Aronson had said, much of this bill is workable and it's, it's already being done by principals and by schools. My hope for this bill would be to see a few edits in the language. Uh, the way it's written provides... Some, some significant limitations in regards to addressing student behaviors while at school. Uh, a couple of, and, and Mr. Aronson had, had previously mentioned it, um, recess detention is not permitted in, le, unless, excuse me, unless a student causes or is likely to cause serious physical harm to students and behaviors. And not all behaviors and, and incidents of behavior are severe 
or cause physical uh, physical distress or physical injury to others. Schools and principals need the ability to address repeated and disruptive behaviors at a time when it causes the least amount of intrusion to learning. And oftentimes that's recess. Um, sometimes it's a five minute conversation, sometimes it's a 10 minute conversation, sometimes it takes longer than that. But we need to have those opportunities to redirect and to teach students the behaviors in which they need to, to be successful in, in that next opportunity when it arises. Uh, also, recess detention is not permitted unless a parent specifically consents to it. This, this specific line I see as being difficult for, for schools because kids want consistency, kids want to know that if I do this, this was what's going to happen. And if a parent is able to say, no, no, no recess detention, for my child, but another parent says, yes, recess detention, it's going to be confusing to students, to staff, and, and to the process of, of having successful recess. And, and I guess you know, sometimes, unfortunately, student behavior at school does necessitate a loss of privilege, as, as harsh as that sounds. We need to be able to have that conversation and to say, come on in here. You know, we need to talk about what happened at a different time. One of the last things that, that I see is the reporting issue. Uh, reporting incidents in DERS is going to create additional work for school staff. And if, if schools are supposed to use this information to determine professional development, it's difficult if parents are going to be able to say, no, my child should not have recess detention. Additionally, in a school like mine, where over 50% of our families work outside of the community and 95% of our students ride the school bus home each day, parents don't want recess, or excuse me, parents want recess detention. They don't want after school detention. So on the instances where I've had to talk with a parent about a behavior choice that their child has made, and we look at down the road and, and we agree that yes, we need to have a detention, they'll often ask, can it be done during the school day? Now, that, that, does, that would skew our data, that would skew our professional development choices. Uh, so I would ask that the, uh, the revisions be considered and that if you've got further questions, you reach out to me. Um, I'm hoping that we can get a bill that is working and, and workable for schools. Thank you. Thank you, Principal. Any questions for any of the testifiers or for the author, Senator Abel? Well, thank you, and I, uh, I don't want, want to be too giddy, but I'm just really happy to be back to this committee, and Mr. Aronson, and he's been here before I got here. And he was a very young man and still is quite young, but I appreciate hearing him, and I, the, the principal, and I, I like the bill. I, I like the young man who testified, and I have a five-year-old grandson who is that, and I would have been that, but I had to sit in the front because my name started with A. Um, and so um, just to, to encourage the author as this moves forward, I, I, think, I think really what we're getting at here with all the comments made with the concerns about implementation is that I think it's a bad idea to take recess away from a young person who clearly needs to go move around a little bit. And there's got to be a better way. I, probably, I think, I don't know what the committee thinks, but I think that's really what your bill is trying to say. Um, and I think as you make it say that, and that there has to be a really good reason to take it away and parents approve or not or whatever consistency, um, that I think that's the tight goal you're after. And so just to, we haven't chatted, and I sit by you, but I, anyway, here I am. But so um, just to encourage you on the, the drafting of the bill, um, Statements of purpose and strong encouragement. You know what that's worth? Yes. Nothing happens when you strongly encourage. If you say, go do this, then they have to do that. So I would just encourage us as this bill moves to, um, like uh, line 18 strongly encourages, and 113 strongly encourages, and there's kind of a statement of purpose in the middle of the first uh, paragraph A. Um, you know, line 117, excessively. What's excessively? That's what law lawyers are going to argue about that. And, oh, it wasn't excessive. And what, I mean, so if we're trying to make them not take a kid away from recess, then let's just 
do that. And there has to be some way better choice. And um, even on line 119, among other things, um, well, of course there's other things. Um, and then encouraging again. And, um, but I, I think it's a really good idea. And I think at the end of the day, we want a way that this becomes like the last choice, in my opinion. I want it to be, I'm just encouraging you to make this bill strong and so the districts know and with respect to the principal who was there, that's not, the, there's got to be four choices ahead of that one and let's just do it that way. And, and then the reporting concerns I think are valid and just to keep it simple. But um, ha, as a person who has attempted to mandate many things on school districts over my time, um, they don't want any. But at the end of the day though, we write the law book. All those books back there were written by us and they have to do it. And so I wish you well in your quest and for the sake of the young man who was simply just amazing today and I, I hear that and I think it's a really good project and if I can help in any way, I'm happy to. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Chair, thank you, Senator Abler. And I, I want to really point out that um, a lot of the encouragement and recommend language was um, a request on behalf of the districts. They wanted to know what they should do. It wasn't just don't tell us what not to do, but also tell us what to do. But I do really want um, to draw your attention to 2.3, that it is really strong as school district or charter must not use recess detention unless. And so there is encouragement language and proactive language, and it was by request of the districts. Um, but then to the strength piece uh, is addressed in, in 2.3. Um, I hope that answers some of your questions, but we can continue having conversations. Thanks. And Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, I was not attempting to pan your bill, but I just, yeah. I want it to work, you know, and so I'm just telling you, um, if you strongly, like, they're going to go home with a shopping list every year, stuff they have to do. They get some money if you do this and all that, and they're like, strongly encouraged, well, that's going to go on the whatever. So it's a way to wheeze a lot of stuff, so just to caution you. Senator, final thoughts? Comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee. The only thing I just want to add at the end um, is, you know, one, I want to remind folks that recess is something that really little children have. And so I, I really appreciate folks who testified in favor of the bill and, and made some suggestions. But um, we don't see recess as a privilege. It is a right that children have to play and move their bodies and be with their friends and build strong social emotional supports. And so we want to be sure that if a student is being removed from recess, it's for a really good reason and really rarely. We know that the most students who are removed and had recessed attention are students of color and students with disabilities. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm all about local control, but this is a statewide solution for a statewide problem. And so whether you live in International Falls or in Virgo Heights, we want to make sure that no matter what kind of student you are, you still have access to the play that you deserve. So I appreciate the time and hope we can recommend this to pass. Thank you. With that said, we are going to lay the bill over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Senator. Just want to remind everybody, we are meeting in room 15, right, in the Capitol on Wednesday. So I'm um, looking forward, same time, not the same place. And looking forward to the meeting on Wednesday. Thank you, everybody. We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>